Yes. All right. So we'll try this again. Good morning. So um, it's a very long presentation with PCOS discussion. Um, and can get my thing out of my way. Um, okay, so PCOS, are we doomed? Is the first question. And is it a disease or a syndrome? Do any of you know if it's a disease or a syndrome? Syndrome. Good. Syndrome. And the reason I put a pendulum there is because it is it is a it is a pendulum, you know. And the best way to counsel patients is that we are going from um, one side to another side. So if you counsel them properly, that it is a pendulum and they can swing from left to the right or right to left, then it's way easier to understand. So um, what this presentation is based off of is the international evidence based guideline uh, of. Uh, they were designed for management of PCOS in 2018. And then ACOG just recently updated their bulletin as well um, from 2018. And they just updated it again in 2020. So, sorry, I'm just having a problem getting rid of this. So PCOS is a sign um, of an issue with reproductive and metabolic and psychological features. And it is one of the most common conditions affecting women between eight to 13% of reproductive age groups. Um, what we need to really be aware of is that there are diverse features associated with PCOS, uh, anxiety, depression, body image issues, irregular menstrual cycles, hirsutism, infertility, and the most uh, com the most important that we need to be aware of is the um, is the anxiety um, is the metabolic syndrome and late onset type two diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors. And as you can see here, seventy percent of the women remain undiagnosed. And we, as a part of our big team, we are definitely need to be more aware of the kind of care we provide. So the public health implications are huge, as you can see, um, that menstrual dysfunction alone um, has cost of 1.35 billion, which is 31% of the entire healthcare spending on women's health. Um, and the infertility care is 533 million and PCOS associated diabetes 1.77 billion annually. And just the hirsutism alone, as you can see, is 622 million. So the total cost of evaluating and providing care to reproductive age group PCOS women in United States was 4.36 billion. And we all have a role to play in management of this. So as always, I split things into what, why, and how. Um, and why are we even studying this? Because it is hard to diagnose and treat it because most of the times we treat women like, hey, okay, you're skinny and you have irregular periods. So it's probably not PCOS. So what, what the mind does not know, the eyes don't see, right? So we have to know what we're looking for and only then we can see it. So we're gonna go over all these items listed here. Um, as I said, we'll go over the pathophysiology, the international guidelines, to how to diagnose and with a focus on quality of life issues, lifestyle changes, pharmacological interventions. Um, the diagnostic criteria, the new ACOG bulletin has all the three in the table. I didn't put it here because um, it's up for reference in the Dropbox as well. But the Rotterdam criteria say um, we need two of the clinical or biochemical parameters, um, two of these three, either hyperandrogenism, ovulatory dysfunction, or PCOS ovaries on ultrasound. If we have irregular periods, uh, which is a function of ovulatory dysfunction and hyperandrogenism, clinical or biochemical, then we don't need ultrasound for diagnosis. Also remember that within eight years of menarche, uh, both hyperandrogenism and ovulatory dysfunction are required. And ultrasound is not required because remember when the girls, uh, when we are just very near puberty or near menarche, the ovulatory cycles are still not regular and the 
FSH-led surgeries are still all over the place. So ultrasound criteria will, may show multiple follicles. Um, so we don't have to rely on that. It's more of a clinical picture. Um, as the technology has advanced, the ultrasound criteria have definitely uh, improved. So this is a very simplistic view of uh, what insulin resistance means. As you can see that insulin is the key that opens up the key to the insulin receptor. And then what does the insulin receptor do? It allows the glucose to go into the cell so that the glucose can be um, metabolized, right? So uh, you see the glucose is floating around outside. And then there is of course the LHFSH imbalance, uh, which is causing indirectly insulin resistance. So again, another um, nice view of what happens is the insulin receptor is not letting insulin act on the glucose to allow the glucose to go inside. As a result, the glucose is sitting around in the uh, bloodstream outside and then it needs to go somewhere else and then it goes into storage in the liver and then it, um, I mean, sorry, not in the liver, peripheral tissues and that's what causes the central obesity and um, other symptoms of type two diabetes and everything. So, um, I do urge you all to look at this. It is complicated, um, but basically, if you think of think of the ovarian androgen production, so start with FSH, right? So FSH production decreases, which causes increased in ovarian thecal stimulation, which causes increased ovarian androgen production, and then the androgen production causes decrease in SHBG, and that is the main reason why all these things are happening because decreased SHBG causes increase in free androgen, which causes hirsutism. Decrease in SHBG also causes increase in free estradiol. And then estrone production increases because we have extra androgens, which are causing peripheral conversion of the estrone. And then the increase in free estro estradiol and estrone cause the estrogen dominance-like symptoms and hyperstimulation of the endometrium. Now what you see, there's also a correlation between the estrone causing decrease in hypothalamic dopamine. And that again, really leads to the brain dysfunction, which is um, depression, anxiety, mood symptoms and all that. So, um, and then the increased estrogen is causing increased fat cell proliferation, which is ca causing obesity. And then the whole cycle goes back to uh, decrease in um, LH release, and then it just becomes a continuing cycle. So back to the diagram of insulin resistance causing increased androgen production, which is causing an ovulation. Um, we talked about this, we talked about this. Now, what does FSH do? And this is um, a really nice, I know you've seen, learned it all along, but basically the follicle, it causes follicle maturation, right? So from primordial follicle, it needs to go into ovulation stage. But what happens with FSH um, in, in this case of uh, PCOS is that the follicles end up staying because the LHFSH don't have the usual pulsatile um, rhythm in case of PCOS, it ends up um, getting arrested in the before the tertiary follicle stage. Again, increase in LH is needed um, and it affects the androgen substrates and then it leads to free increase in free testosterone which causes excess body and facial hair. Uh, and as I was talking about, the follicle gets arrested um, in the, either the tertiary small antral phase or even in the primary follicular phase. So these are the causes of the symptoms that we discussed before. Um, again, it's the central obesity causing glucose intolerance, hypertension, dyslipidemia, long-term sequelae can be vascular disease. And again, the brain endocrine manifestations um, are all interrelated between the insulin production is uh, affecting the adrenal gland, the ovaries and the liver. And then uh, that causes increase in androgen activity through decrease in SHPG. And the clinical presentation of all of these findings can be infertility, menstrual disturbances and increased hair growth. So screening, um, diagnostic, uh, 
all these things we're going to discuss one by one. Uh, these are the presenting features that can happen with PCOS. Um, we'll go by one by one, but just so you know, there is ethnic variation. Um, so we have to be aware of uh, different populations who may have presenting symptoms. They may look hirsute, but they're not really PCOS because that's just how they are genetically made up. Um, in adolescence, you have there's a different definition of abnormal uterine bleeding, which is defined as normal in the first year of postmenarche as a part of the pubertal transition. So between one to three years postmenarche, the menstrual cycles less than 21 days or more than 45 days, and more than one year postmenarche, more than 90 days of amenorrhea is then considered abnormal uterine bleeding. Or if you have primary amenorrhea by the age of 15 or more than three years post Telarchy. So when you get an adolescent with irregular menstrual cycles, then it's better to have an open discussion and then talk about all the other varying um, diagnostic challenges that we face. You know how a lot of times patients will come and say, well, my ovaries are polycystic. I have PCOS. Can I please check my ovaries again? So you have to explain to them uh, what PCOS really means instead of just going by the ultrasound or one clinical pictures. But what you can say is you may not have full-blown PCOS right now. And as, as I said, it's a pendulum. So you can counsel them that they could be at an increased risk in later life. So starting lifestyle changes right now may help control a syndrome which may or may not happen. Uh, adults more than three years post menarche up to perimenopause, um, if their cycles are less than 21 days or more than 35 days or less than eight cycles per year. And then same thing, more than 90 days per cycle. And this is exactly why it is imperative that we all document uh, our menstrual history properly and just not just write irregular periods. So you, if you write periods last three days by 45 to 60 days, then you know that it is oligomenorrhea by the old definition. How do we document biochemical um, hyperandrogenism? You calculate free and bioavailable testosterone, which is already in our panel now uh, because we have SHPG and estrogen, progesterone, everything. So the lab is calculating for us, but if you don't have it, then there are free calculators online that you can just plug in your numbers. Uh, DHEAS, uh, dehydroepiandrostindione sulfate, is useful only if um, it is extremely high and if the testosterone is normal and the patient has symptoms of hyperandrogenism. It indicates adrenal production. How um, and when are is PCOS um, panel should be used is the patient needs to be off of hormonal contraception for at least three months because Hormonal contraception affects SHBG levels and affects estrogen and progesterone levels. So uh, the results may not be accurate. The only thing that will be accurate would be your hemoglobin A1C, CBC, and CMP. So if patients want that, then you have to wait for that amount. Clinical diagnosis, comprehensive history and physical, as we know, um, look for acne, alopecia, hirsutism. In adolescents, if they have severe acne and hirsutism, then it's important. You can do the ferryman galvey scale. Um, a lot of it is just clinical diagnosis that you can tell by looking at them. For alopecia, there's a Ludwig scale, but you can basically see male pattern baldness. Um, and what is mainly key is we do not pay special attention to the negative psychosocial impact of hyperandrogenism and body habitus. So, if the patients are bothered by their unwanted excess hair growth or male pattern boneless, then we have to pay attention to the psychosocial impact as well. Ultrasound. So ultrasound is the one that's very confusing. That's why I wish we had sonographers on this uh, meeting. Ultrasound should not be diagnosed, should not be used for diagnosis of PCOS in patients who are less than eight years of menarche because like, as I mentioned, they have high incidence of multifollicular ovaries. If patients have irregular menstrual cycles and hyperandrogenism, um, then we do not require ultrasound for PCOS diagnosis. So it's a lot of it is very clinical diagnosis. Now, the guidelines for PCOS, according to this international working group, uh, there 
they're recommending that follicle number per ovary should be more than 20 or an ovarian volley more than 10 ml, which does not include corpus luteum cysts or dominant follicles. But ACOG's recent update says either one or both ovaries, either 12 or more follicles, which are measuring between two to nine um, in diameter and greater than 10 centimeter uh, cubic centimeter volume is sufficient for diagnosis. Uh, ACOG also mentions pay special attention to endometrial abnormalities and which is what we do at all our locations is we monitor the endometrial thickness in case it's thicker, heterogeneous, polypoidal, because these women are at higher risk of endometrial hyperplasia because of unopposed estrogen. And consider repeating postmenstrual sonogram. Clear protocols are recommended for reporting follicles. Tammy, can you wait until the end? Um, sure. Clear protocols are recommended for reporting follicles. Um, so our sonographers do report it like that, but it's urged that everyone reports the actual number of follicles. LMP should always be mentioned, transducer width, uh, bandwidth, total follicles in the 3D dimensions and endometrial thickness. As you can see, the new technology sonograms are much, much better and you can see all the multifollicular looking ovary. Now, ultrasound caveats, which a lot of people don't know about, so I put them here. Um, I don't know how many times you've seen patients who have Mirena or who are on mainly progesterone-only pills or on Depo and Explanon. The sonographer will tell you the ovaries look multifollicular and polycystic. So that is, that's just how the ovaries look. They may or may not have PCOS, so please don't tell the patient you have PCOS while she's on progesterone-only contraception or even combined oral contraceptive pills. Go by the clinical picture, the rest of the picture. AMH is not useful for diagnosis of PCOS. It is useful for diagnosis of ovarian reserve in infertile patients. Um, ethnic variation, as I said, so some you know um, Eastern European patients, they look like they could be polycystic, they look hirsute, they look like they have male pattern behaviors, but they may not be PCOS. It's just their body habitus. Now, another key thing is perimenopause. Similar FSH, LH, pulsatile changes happen when patients are in perimenopause. So it looks exactly like PCOS, but it just could be simply them going through perimenopausal changes. Uh, we know we should be screening them for obesity, dyslipidemia, cigarette smoking, hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance. This is why our PCOS panel is very, very extensive um, because we want to be able to screen them for any slight changes. Uh, all of them have, should be having fasting lipid profile um, and, you know, as you can see below. GDM and not, um, NIDDM risk. Uh, this is, again, recommended across nationally as well as internationally, that we should be doing a baseline hemoglobin A1c um, and then at least one to three, every one to three years. We can use an oral glucose tolerance test if the BMI is more than 25, and then it should be offers to all women who are trying to get pregnant. And I know we haven't been really offering it since we stopped doing OB, but we really should start to offer that for women who are planning pregnancy, a two-hour OGT. And if we missed it, then in the first trimester, it should definitely be done. Now, this is a largely unknown thing that we forget about. Our overweight patients can have sleep apnea. Um, so if the patient is coming to you with like disturbed sleep patterns, obesity, they have unexplained fatigue, then they could be having sleep apnea. Endometrial cancer, uh, PCOS patients have two to six fold increased risk of endometrial cancer, which can present before menopause. Um, so this is why the abnormal uterine bleeding guidelines that we have, that even if the patient is under 45 with risk factors, which are obesity, abnormal uterine bleeding, or family history, we should consider endometrial sampling in all of those patients. As many of you have experienced, we have diagnosed a lot of endometrial hyperplasia in younger women. Uh, optimal prevention of endometrial hyperplasia strategy is un still unknown, but uh, lifestyle changes and com uh, combination oral contraceptive pills may help in women who are anovulatory and whose cycles are more than 90 days apart. 
obesity, as we discussed, um, impacts ovulatory dysfunction and also um, affects the time to conception, infertility, and response to ovulation. There is an increased risk of miscarriage, hyperglycemia, preeclampsia, increased perinatal morbidity, risk of fecal macrosomia. Um, and when all this is combined with insulin resistance, diabetes, the adverse outcomes can be synergistic. So even though we're not doing obstetrics anymore, we have to be very conscious of all these things when patients are coming to us, um, even if they are not trying to be pregnant, is to make them aware of all these things. Again, don't go right away telling people, well, you're gonna have a high risk of miscarriage because you have PCOS. We need to counsel them properly that the weight, overweight and PCOS can increase the risk of, or delay the time to conception. So screening and assessment of well-being is extremely, extremely important. Um, PCOS patients have a very high risk, um, high incidence of depression, PMS, and you know, mood and anxiety disorders. Um, so quality of life uh, discussion is important. Screening for depression, uh, psychosexual function, body image, and eating disorder, extremely, extremely important. Eating disorders are very common um, in PCOS patients. So this quality of life tool, it is available online, um, which discusses these five domains of body hair, emotions, weight, menstrual problems, and infertility. Honestly, our own PCOS journal has all these demo domains and more, and I'm actually going to start doing a study on that so we can also document it, but um, our, our tool itself is pretty comprehensive. Again, as I mentioned, screen every patient for anxiety and depressive symptoms. And um, you know, if they need, we should definitely be referring them to the correct uh, professionals and also ourselves get trained a little bit on how to help. Um, simple screening questionnaire, which is inbuilt in our EMR, but asking these questions in the last two weeks, how many times have you felt down or depressed, little interest in pleasure, feeling nervous and not able to stop or control worrying, um, that really helps. And if you are using medication, then remember that PCOS alone can also activate these symptoms of uh, emotional uh, dysregulation. So this is also female sexual function index. So they also have associated complaints of uh, or problems with libido, desire, and uh, performance because everything, again, is interrelated, correct? Um, so screen every patient. Um, ask these questions on a typical day, do you spend more than one hour per day worrying about your experience, uh, your appearance? Because they have body image issues, as I mentioned, it may not be just because of their hirsutism, but it can also be due to just the body habitus. So asking these clear directed questions will help. What specific concerns do you have? What effect does it have on your life? Does it make it hard to do your work or to be with your friends or family? Eating disorders, uh, there is a scoff questionnaire, uh, which again is an online tool, uh, but two questions that you can ask is, does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? And are you satisfied with your eating patterns? Um, as far as referrals for eating disorders, uh, Poen Children's and LIJ, they have an eating disorder a center, which is pretty comprehensive. Uh, so you can refer to them, but also because the patients trust us as caregivers, uh, taking care of them ourselves is also a very powerful tool because um, they actually confide in you as your, since you are the primary care provider for many, many of these women. Physical exam, as we know, uh, blood pressure, BMI, uh, extremely important. Waist circumference, value more than 35 inches is abnormal. And then inspection for stigmata of hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance, acne, and acanthosis nigricans, uh, extremely important. Look for signs of skin discoloration in the neck region and in the um, um, axillae. So this is um, in our panel, See the complete blood count, CMP, total free testosterone, SHPG, FSH, estradiol, DHES. People have asked me what significance does DHEs have? And as I said, it's more than 700 nanogram per ml can be significant for something possible adrenal. You can also uh, consider repeating it again after um, you know, 
monitor if it is peri around 700 or so you can just repeat it in a um, six weeks or three months after just monitoring their uh, symptoms um tsh hcg prolactin always do an hcg of course because you know if they have oligomenorrhea, you want to rule out pregnancy lipid profile and vitamin d levels there is so much data that has accumulated over years now that vitamin D deficiency can cause similar symptoms and it can cause depression, dementia, anxiety, diabetes itself. So vitamin D supplementation is extremely important. Uh, hemoglobin A1C and fasting blood sugar, 17 hydroxyprogesterone to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, as far as insulin levels, I know we have insulin in our panel, but remember random insulin levels are not um, not specific because insulin levels change with whatever we eat um, or any intake basically. So fasting insulin is the one that is a little bit more suggestive of um, hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. We have recently added a nutritional uh, vitamin B panel to, to our PCOS panel because like, I'll go in depth a little bit later, but everything is interrelated. 24-hour um, urinary cortisol should be considered if everything else comes back normal, but the patient has similar body habitus, and this is to rule out Cushing syndrome. These are the values for two-hour OGTT. I'm not going to go over in detail. It's all um, in our protocol and on the ACOG side as well. But remember that fasting lipid and lipoprotein level, if the HDL is less than 50 and triglycerides more than 150, then uh, we have to strongly recommend nutritional and dietary interventions. Differential diagnosis and PCOS imitators. So Cushing syndrome, as I mentioned before, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the way it's gonna, sometimes the late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia will mimic PCOS, um, exactly like this. It's rare, but this is the reason we have to test for it. And the treatment for that is pretty simple, is low dose uh, dexamethasone. So uh, make sure that our panels have all these um, parameters. Now, premature ovarian failure can also mimic this. And I've had quite a few patients um, in the last many years who have been, you know, um, diagnosed with premature ovarian failure or vice versa, and uh, that's what they have. So if you have low FSH, low LH, low estradiol, then consider premature ovarian failure. Um, I know we've had a full lecture on that, so um, try to interpret your findings according to the FSH, LH, estradiol um, box that we discussed before. Exogenous drugs such as antidepressants can give you a very similar picture because they can cause overweight, mood symptoms, and irregular periods, severe hypothyroidism. And then hormones um, such as Depo, implants, Mirena can do exactly, can give you the exact same picture. Perimenopause, as I mentioned, and then adrenal or androgen producing ovarian tumors. So that is why ultrasound and evaluation of the um, blood test is extremely important. The treatment approach, um, see this acronym PCOS, so go by that. P for physical, C for chemical, O for organic or holistic approach, and S for psychosexual um, and sexual health. Um, let us go, everything is related as I mentioned. So brain is FSHLH, adrenal is androstenedione, dion androstenedione dion sulfate and cortisol. And then the entire reproductive health system, the ovarian and fecal production of um, estrogen, estrogen, peripheral conversion as well. And the gut is affecting the absorption and enterohepatic recirculation of those estrogen um, metabolites and, and estrone and estradiol. So the typical pharmacological intervention is metformin with or without oral contraceptive pills. Enough trials at this point to say uh, to show us that metformin helps with insulin sensitivity and decreases the fasting, ins fasting insulin levels, uh, improves HDL and testosterone levels. Metformin alone can also help with hirsutism and uh, menstrual regulation. And then birth control pills with lifestyle change also help. So adding metformin, um, if patients are just doing lifestyle change, also helps with um, the BMI and menstrual regulation. So the protocol that I recommend, and we 
all should be really following that is start slow because metformin causes a lot of gastric disturbances and patients will give up in three days if they, you don't start slow. So start with 500 only, extended release with dinner, always has to be taken with food. Increase to 1000 milligram extended release after one week or even after two weeks. Um, please, please add coenzyme Q10 because metformin depletes that from our um, PrEP cycle. So we have to replace that. So 200 milligram daily, daily multivitamins, vitamin D and pro and prebiotics. And prebiotics play a role in preventing enterohepatic recirculation and helps with estrogen metabolism, which is another complicated pathway, but there's a reason why we recommend that. And of course, exercise. What to do if the patient is not trying to conceive? Um, first line, I know that's what we're taught, right? Do monophasic oral contraceptive pills. Please remember to start monophasic and for those of you who don't understand what monophasic and triphasic means, monophasic means we're giving the same dose every single day. And that is what causes the adequate suppression of um, um, estrogen production to enable uh, decrease in free androgen production. And that's how it helps with the symptoms of hirsutism. If you use triphasic, the doses are changing every week uh, and that does not cause an effective suppression of uh, free androgen production. Uh, start with the low dose, um, try to use the ones which have ethanol estradiol uh, and disogestrel and levonorgestrel instead of um, um, the medroxyprogestron type of progestins. And so the generic ones easiest are microgestin, Janelle, Elise. Standard dose means the ones that have 30 to 35 micrograms of uh, estradiol, and they uh, are recommended if patient is having breakthrough bleeding on the low dose ones. Transdermal are really, really good for um, breakthrough bleeding and patients who are forgetful. So we can use a patch or we can use the NuvaRing. And the way we recommend monitoring, especially with PCOS patients, is try to do the first visit after three months, um, then every six months monitor blood pressure, weight, weight loss, and all these things. Anti-androgens should be considered only after six months of if the combination pills have failed or cosmetic therapy have failed. They do have side effects. Spironolactone, you have to monitor the potassium, and then it does cause weight gain, bloating, and sometimes mood symptoms, so I don't really like it, but um, maybe one in 5,000 patients is on uh, spironolactone. Um, the, like I mentioned before, the OCPs containing norethesterone, levonorgestrel, and norgestimate have, uh, the, have the lowest risk of uh, DVT. Metformin we talked about. Other medications which are anti, um, you know, obesity medications, there is no clear evidence of benefit, but they could uh, help with weight loss and lifestyle. So if the patient is unable to um, reduce their weight with the help of lifestyle that you can consider referring them to an obesity specialist. Um, as I mentioned, antiandrogens can be tried, but they do have um, side effects. If patient is trying to get pregnant, then ovulation induction. Um, the latest ACOG bulletin is actually recommending letrozole over Clomid because of the risk, uh, decreased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. Totally fine, any of these we can use um, starting from day three to day seven or day five to day nine. Um, increase, adding metformin to ovulation induction regimen helps reduce um, risk of miscarriages and increases the um, incidence of spontaneous ovulation as well. So um, I personally always would like to ha have people on metformin while I'm doing ovulation induction. And of course, don't forget our regular infertility protocol um, to check for tubal patency and normal se semen analysis before you start with ovulation induction. Laparoscopic surgery, um, the old school PCOS drilling, um, it's not really beneficial. It may have a very transient role. Bariatric surgery is extremely effective. If women have BMI more than 35 and other complicating factors, bariatric surgery will help you know, um, balance out their blood pressure, uh, all of the altered lipid profile, and also increase their chance of conception. 
Um, but after bariatric surgery, please, please, please consider malabsorption of nutrients. So if the patient has stopped going to their primary care doctor or uh, the bariatric surgeon, we are the ones who are responsible and we should be recommending the full slew of uh, supplement and the vitamins that are absorbed from the stomach. And I can share the list with you, but we are the ones responsible for the well-being in that case. Um, bariatric surgery does improve pregnancy outcomes and decreases the risk of endometrial hyper and carcinoma. So if patients are hesitant, sometimes that may be the way you counsel them that it will help them stay healthy and reduce the risk of carcinoma. So going to the alternative approach now, pharmaceutical we discussed already, which was your PCOS. Um, and then in this, my acronym is LAMPS. So L for lifestyle change, A for alternative approach, M for mental wellness, P for physical wellness, and S for social wellness. And this will remind us not to forget that it is a multi-system syndrome which affects every aspect of their life. Um, why should we try alternative approaches? Because oral contraceptive pills have all these side effects. And you know when you have young women and they have been on OCPs from a very young age, this is all that happens. And I know all of you have already seen this in your practices. Low libido, vaginal, severe, severe vaginal atrophy sometimes causes depression, bloating. And of course, you have other patients who um, cannot take OCPs because of either uh, neural ef effects, neurological side effects, or just plain depression and mood changes or breast uh, tenderness and other things. Uh, metformin can cause GI effects. And then as I know Astoria clientele um, prefers a holistic approach, most women nowadays are reading more and more and they want the holistic approach. So uh, what do we do in the lifestyle change? We dare to do a lifestyle change. We change their diet, their attitude, their routine and exercise. So um, key is also to manage their food sensitivities in cases of dietary intervention, because a lot of them will have similar symptoms, malabsorption because they have gluten sensitivity or food intolerances. So um, what we recommend is an elimination diet, take two weeks, avoid dairy and see how you feel and document your symptoms in the following two weeks, uh, reduce, remove gluten from your diet and see how you feel. And I can tell you that 90% of the patients who have these issues are gonna feel markedly different. And of course, it'll take time for you to uh, get them to be compliant, but starting that counseling from the very beginning of our visits is pretty important, especially when the sonographer tells you there's a lot of gas and the bowel seems irritated. That is an indication that there could be food sensitivities going on. Um, recommended dietary restriction is reducing the energy deficit of by 30%, but ensuring that we're giving enough macro and micronutrients reducing processed foods, extremely important, and asking them to take fresh, green, colorful foods, three to four servings every day is extremely important. When you talk about fresh, green, and colorful, and you talk to them, and the patients will say, uh, well, I'm taking, I'm adding strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries and everything in my smoothie. So that is not colorful. It is colorful, it's rich in antioxidants, yes, but it also is very rich in fructose and sugar, which is, exactly what they don't need. So talking in detail about what exactly they're consuming every day is very, very powerful. So increasing the protein helps and reducing high glycemic index foods, eating organic poultry and meats. Um, the reason I'm adding organic here, even though I don't like to just say, say these things, um, like eat organic, it's because of the added hormones and pesticides in the meat and poultry and that, that functions as xenoestrogens and xenoestrogens are estrogen mimickers, which go into the body and give you exact symptoms of hyperestrogenism and estrogen dominance and create PCOS-like picture. And a healthy gut is key because um, that is how our hormones, estrogen, progesterone are metabolized. And uh, we wanna have a healthy gut to have excretion of all the metabolites properly. Uh, lifestyle and attitude intervention. This is from our, um, you know, we did the diet right there. So A for attitude. Attitude is where it's extremely important because they are so depressed and frustrated and they're like, I'm trying everything, nothing's working. So give them small and achievable goals. 
only five to 10% of weight loss will help resume normal periods in many, many women because it's all about just getting their metabolic system going. So give them very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals. So many of the patients, I will make them, before I leave the room, I will make them put it on their calendar saying five minute walk at 4 p.m. every day. So something small and measurable, extremely important and extremely powerful. Because otherwise they'll say, well, I have a gym membership and yes, I'll go, but they never end up going. So starting small is, is the way to go. Creating a self-monitoring protocol or an accountability partner is helpful. Talk to them about the anxiety symptoms and also address disordered eating. Don't assume that they do not have eating disorders. R is for routine. Developing a routine is extremely important. Like, you know, when you start talking to them, okay, when you get up, do you have breakfast every day? No, um, I don't. I just run straight to work or they're working till late every night. So sleep hygiene or routine is extremely important in helping with balancing out all the um, depression and anxiety and mood changes that happen with PCOS. The power of healthy habits uh, is something that we really need to inculcate not only in ourselves, but also in our patients. Uh, exercise, this is the standard recommendation, a minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity for people between 18 to 64 years of age. And for younger people, uh, more 60 minutes of intense physical activity per day is recommended. And the activity can be performed in 10 minute bouts or around thousand steps, as we say, and then at least 30 minutes daily on most days. Again, realistic and physical smart goals. Nowadays, there are lots of apps that are available that can help them be compliant. Uh, there's a new app called AIM7 that I'm gonna actually send you the link for. It is free and it helps people be accountable every morning. They'll get a little thing in their um, app saying, hey, if you don't feel good, just do five minutes today, but 20 minutes tomorrow. So it's a very customizing sort of a, a platform, customized platform. So the alternative approach, uh, which may seem a little too intense, um, but we do have detailed handouts as, as I told you before. The goal of the alternative approach or uh, the natural supplements is to target the glycemic control and insulin resistance. And there's antioxidants in there and some have anti-androgenic properties and some provide luteal phase support and estrogen help um, combat estrogen dominance. And these are the patients where you can consider the 28 day salivary hormone testing, which um, I know we've talked about before, but I'll go over that a little bit here. These are the natural supplements that are recommended. I can go over one by one. Um, don't give throw, throw it all at once to the, with the patient. I have a detailed PCOS handout and I cannot tell you how many people uh, have resumed normal periods or um, have had improved quality of life index if they follow the protocol properly. Um, what you need before throwing everything at that patient is they have to be understanding and compliant. So that is why you always have to ask them, do you want me to help you um, or do you just wanna take medication? And if they say yes, then you have to go slow and explain all these things very slowly. So just to quickly go over, saw palmetto is anti-androgenic, very, very powerful. It does cause bloating, so don't give it to everyone um, just right away. Counsel that it has to be taken with food. Chaseberry help is for luteal phase support. It has a little bit of progesterogenic action. So um, you can give it in the luteal phase between day 14 to day 25 um, or the new supplement combination that I was telling you about uh, in the last meeting is called FemGuard Balance that has a combination of um, Chaseberry and other medications that help with estrogen dominance. Chromium is for glycemic control. There's more than enough studies showing that chromium supplementation alone helps reduce hemoglobin A1C. Multivitamins with activated folate and B12 help give the Krebs cycle support, which is needed for the whole um, metabolic cycle to go in the right pathway. DHEA helps give the adrenal support and helps reduce the production of DHEAS um, and increase cortisol production. CoQ10 is again for Krebs cycle support. Vitamin D we talked about. Um, alpha lipoic acid helps with uh, liver support to help with the detoxification of um, estradiol uh, metabolites. 
And then all the ones below are um, helpful in glycemic control. Um, if there's high insulin and A1C, berberine, again, a lot of data there, berberine helps reduce um, your A1C and fasting blood sugars. M um, in the lamps is for the mental uh, wellness, extremely important as we talked about. There are various apps available, Headspace, Talkspace, they can undergo group therapy. There are support groups. Developing positive habits reinforces mental wellness. And the counseling on your part as a provider has to be, you are not alone. Uh, PCOS is, is a, according to me, it is a pandemic at this point because of a lot of issues in our environment, but if you counsel them properly, then they don't feel so alone that I'm the only one who's suffering from this. Please, please, please avoid giving antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds right away because believe it or not, SSRIs affect libido. They do cause weight gain and SSRIs adversely affect the cortisol balance and then they can create a vicious cycle where uh, the patient is not gonna get out of it um, easily. P again, physical wellness, we talked about this already. And S is for social wellness, support groups, um, group therapy, body image affirming activities, and helping them document the progress will help them feel better about themselves. Our, our own PCOS journal has all these items and I will just go over that. If you help them document that, they can see their own progress themselves. Um, monthly, our monthly journals, and this is the one I was talking about as a PCOS tool, screening tool. Um, menstrual cycle irregularities, mood symptoms, weight changes, food cravings, hair growth, and acne um, can be used as a screening tool as well as monitoring tool. Six monthly, we should, after you put them on a detailed regimen, um, initial visits should be two weeks, six weeks, three months, but then every six months, we need to check all these things. This is our um, journal that you can see it is in the Dropbox. This is our daily journal. Um, this is our monthly journal in which they can put every month's date and then document the periods of weight, unwanted hair growth, and bowel complaints. The reason I have bowel and fatigue everywhere is because I mentioned it's all related. If, you, if their bowel is not working correctly, there's no um, amount of medications you can give them that will be effective. Now, this is an example of a sa um, salivary rhythm test. Uh, many of you don't know what that is, but this is what they do is they spit in a test tube every morning, um, starting from day three of their cycle, and that documents um, their estrogen levels and progesterone levels and free testosterone levels. So as you can see, the middle green in this graph is supposed to be the normal est um, estrogen cycle. And you see the, how the estrogen is rising and then rising again, and th this is the top half of it. And as you see below, the progesterone is just not the blue one should be the progesterone rise, which should start rising from day 15. Um, instead of the normal peak, it's like kind of hanging low. And that's where the patient is having PMS-like symptoms, also having hyperestrogenism symptoms, and she may or may not get a period properly because the progesterone is not rising and then following, falling. So this is out of pocket. Usually the cost is about $200, $250. Um, they pay the company directly, the company's name is Genova. We have the rhythm kits in all the offices. And again, it may not, all the patients may not wanna do it, but when patients come and ask you that question, well, my blood work was normal, you really have to counsel them that blood work at one point in time is not an accurate reflection of what's happening in your body all day long and every day. All the patients who have done this test on, and when we see the results together, we review the results together. I pull up the results on the laptop and discuss with them. They are so happy and they feel relieved that, okay, I wasn't crazy. This means that there is something wrong with me. Or if some, everything is right, then they're like, okay, at least my hormones are right. So all the paintings that you have in your rooms have the estrogen progesterone cycle. So try to use that to educate the patients to say, this is how it should be. And there's probably a variation happening and that's why you're having all these mood symptoms. Um, so again, is it a disease or a syndrome? It is a syndrome, but it's also a pendulum that can swing from no symptom to the 
to the other extreme where you can have full-blown PCOS. So we are not doomed if we follow all the, the entire spectrum of interventions. Um, it is hard, it's a, but it is important that we educate our patients and ourselves on how to fix the condition. Not fix, um, fix is the wrong word, to control the condition. So I will, um, if anyone has case studies, we can, we can talk about that right now. Anyone has any questions, we can talk about that as well. I definitely have a few questions. Go for it. All right. Um, so my first is, um, should everyone get metformin if their A1C and insulin levels are okay or even low? or HDL, testosterone, all that is okay as well? So good question. What did we just talk about in, in the presentation? When do you think we should give metformin, even if everything is normal? I know I'm turning the question back to you. Well, you said like parasitism and that it can help with all that too, and obviously to regulate menses, but you know, what if the patient tries it and even if they do take the CoQ10 or they don't listen to the advice and don't take the CoQ10 and they have side effects and they refuse to take it anymore. Yep. So then we can take it off. So if the patient has all normal lab values, but she's slightly overweight in the um, overweight or obese section, then metformin will help with regulation of cycles. But if they don't take CoQ10, it's they're having GI disturbances, then yeah, they don't need to take it. They can focus on just the physical and lifestyle changes. Um, as I mentioned, it requires a lot of compliance um, from the patient, both metformin mm -hmm. and lifestyle change as well. Sorry. Do you not want to give it to them if their A1C is low or their insulin is low? No, I don't go by that because, again, one at one period in time, insulin level alone doesn't really indicate what's going on in the body. For that, I would like to do a 24-hour insulin. So I'll go by the clinical picture. If the patient okay. is overweight, then I would like to do metformin if they are inclined, especially if they're trying for, to get pregnant. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did have a patient mention um, doing authentic instead. And Sorry. I, uh, I Repeat that. not comfortable prescribing that. <laughs> so I did refer her to like an obesity specialist, but like her PCP wouldn't prescribe it and said, go back to GYN and see if they'll do it. And I was like, uh. Wait, prescribe what? I you Ozempic. Ozempic, it's a weekly Ozempic, injection yes, instead of metformin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't recommend doing that ourselves. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of alternative therapies also in our um, you know, our more. So I would not go there. We can send them to obesity specialists for that. Yeah, good. Okay, that's what I did. Um, Tammy, you had something in the beginning. Yeah, um, I'm just, I'm pulling up a casing and I had to log back into my, one second. Um, so I had a patient, yeah. I was talking, when you were talking about sonogram. Yeah, yeah. Um, and endometrial um, surveillance. I have a 35 year old, the ET is fine. I'm gonna read you her, um, her scenario in one second. Her ET is fine, but she has cystic spaces. And I just want, um, wanted you, if you could like cover what that is and uh, why that needs to be biopsied. So we, so. yeah, that's good, good point. We have a lot of times such a situation with our patients too. Cystic spaces can indicate many things. Um, it could indicate endometrial hyperplasia, of course, but it also can be sometimes cystic if uh, the patient has either retained contraceptive, uh, retained products of con contraception, or they've had previous surgery causing intrauterine scarring, or it could be multiple endometrial polyps. So the best way to address that is repeat the post, repeat a postmenstrual sonogram. And if the patient is not postmenstrual or the patient is menopausal, then I do recommend endometrial sampling if, um, the endometrium looks heterogeneous and um, cystic because that could be something pre-malignant. Okay, so this patient, can I, do you want to, can we yeah. do a, this case study, is that all right? Yeah. So this is um, a 35-year-old para zero. 
she had used depo um, for several years, but had her last depo in 2014. And in 20, between 2014 and 2016, she never resumed menstruation. In 2016, the chart shows that she was prescribed a Provera challenge, but she said she took it, never had a period, and then she moved and never got followed up. And then she gives a history of no period from 2015 to June of 2021. And then she resumed monthly periods. Um, and she had a period in June of 2021. And then she's had normal, she had normal periods in January, February, sorry, January, February, March, April, May, and June of 2021. Um, she has no recent changes in her weight. And I'll give you her BMI in a second. I just have to switch, string, uh, switch, switch um, screens. And she is trying to conceive and her labs were more or less normal. Uh, I went back, I added a 17 hydroxyprogesterone and an androstenedione, dione, but she hasn't done those yet. Um, the only thing, her free testosterone was actually okay. It was 2.8 and her total was 34. Her DHEA was the only thing I think that came back off and that was 322, so elevated. Um, estradiol was fine, FSH and LH were fine. Estradiol was 30, well, 32. And FSH five, LH uh, 14.5 actually. So she has a, an odd ratio there, but I don't know where we caught her in that cycle. And her thyroid was fine. And her BMI is 34. Okay. So she's trying to get pregnant now, right? So two, two, no, two Oh, and then she she's the one with the cystic spaces. So her ET, her ET, sorry, her ET was um her ET is one centimeter, uh, but tiny cystic spaces in the endometrium, right ovary and left ovary, normal flow, no, 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 no cysts. Yeah. So what if the main questions for, for you are, when was the sonogram done? Was it post-menstrual and when was the blood work done? Right. Right. So, so I, right. Yeah. So um, I, I might be able to answer that. Hang on one second. Her LMP, when I saw her, should be in my vitals. One second. I saw her 614. Oh, no, no, I, she, she had a period on 614 and she did this blood work on 727. Yeah, so, so the blood yeah. work in terms of the FSH, LH, estrogen, progesterone is pretty irrelevant in this case because it is very hard. She could be in the luteal phase, she could be in the middle where the estrogen is falling. So an ideal way to to do this analysis would be to do during the period to get a baseline. Um, so since it's within normal range, that's fine. We don't have to worry about that. The endometrial thickness looks like she's pre-menstrual at this point. So I would definitely repeat it like on day six, day seven of her period. And because her BMI is 34, she would be a good candidate to start metformin, especially if she's trying to conceive. And I would still add vitamin D and the biotin and all the other things for sure. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree the, 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 the I don't, can I, can I call this PCOS? If good question. So if she's getting regular periods at this point and doesn't have indication, uh, clinical hyperandrogenism or biochemical hyperandrogenism, then technically she may not be PCOS, but like she could be along the spectrum, remember? So yeah. the pendulum could be on the left at this point, but maybe it was to the right because of whatever reasons from 2014 to 2020. Right, okay. Yeah. Good, any other question? Anyone? I do have another one. Okay. Um, that new vitamin panel that was added, Yeah. like all the bees and all that breakdown, what is, 
is that just so we can say, okay, you need vitamin B supplements or like what? Yeah, yeah. Unless they're completely off, then they could indicate malabsorption going on. So uh, we're we're kind of then we have to go back to questioning the patient about how's your bowel doing and what's happening. Is there anything else going on? Um, that's a you know I mean that's a whole another topic for full discussion. Is there there are a lot of uh, patients who had miscarriages and then they can have MPHFR mutation, which can cause low folate levels. So sometimes supplementing people with folate can help with miscarriages or you know, metabolic issues. There's also increasing research and data on um, patients with depression that don't respond to medications have COMT, uh, catecholamine methyltransferase mutations, um, which lead to, um, you know, all these symptoms as well. So just folate supplementation and B12 supplementation can help with that. So, um, so yeah. Evaluate the levels. If they're low, we can recommend supplementation. But if it's really off, then they may require more extensive testing. And so most of the abnormals I see from that panel, they're like elevated, like high out of the range. What do we do? Do we do anything about that? Um, unless they are super high, uh, we don't have to worry about it because the blood levels are, again, not very indicative. And those are reference ranges. But if they are right, super right. high, then yeah, we should reach out to the patient and ask you know, maybe they're consuming five different kinds of supplements, um, which is causing super high B12 levels and stuff. So B vitamins are water soluble, toxicity is extremely low. Um, so unless it's really high, you don't have to worry much about it. Okay, I'm just been saying stable. Yeah. Very cool. Good. Anyone else has anything burning? I have a few comments. Um, just this is a digression, but um, some of the indices on the postmenopausal patients in um, in Astoria, where they call it cystic, I go in there and I see small endometrial polyps. So that's just a comment for that. Uh, also, the spironolactone. We do have some patients um, that come on spironolactone from dermatology. Um, and also we have some uh, providers that are prescribing spironolactone for PCOS patients in Astoria. Uh, so for me, it's important that they know that it's teratogenic. So keep them on their OCPs. If they don't want to be on OCPs and they're taking it for acne or hirsutism, you have to counsel them to discontinue it right away if they get pregnant because uh, it can lead to ambiguous genitalia. Um, and if uh, I, I know we have one provider who, who has them come back for, for BMPs for monitoring for potassium while on spironolactone. And it's not really necessary that if they don't have underlying kidney disease, you don't necessarily have to do that. I don't know, Dr. Gupta, if you uh, do that or not, but um, you know it does affect the, the aldosterone. So that's why it could lead to too much potassium or hyperkalemia, but I don't know if it's actually beneficial to a healthy patient to, to monitor their potassium levels. So, um, good. Yeah, I agree. We don't need to do it every six months, but for all PCOS patients, I like to do a CMB anyway, at least once a year to check their LFTs as well as to check their A1C and all that. So that's the only thing we could do. I do recommend doing that. I hate spironolactone. And I pretty much take it all, take all people off when they come to me. Um, I have seen a lot of walk-in providers do that. So I would really recommend, and I hope that this presentation makes them understand that we can control PCOS without spironolactone, unless it's very, yeah. very high testosterone that's not responding to anything else. That's usually as well. I, I counsel them that electrolysis or OCP is decreasing the amount of androgen secreted from the ovaries, but Usually spironolactone is like a second, third line for right. me as well. Yeah. Uh, and metformin and all the alternative therapies really help bring it down too. Um, Tammy, you have raised your hand again. Yeah. Um, I think you, you, start, you talked about this a little bit, but can you go over like when you decide to stop or do a trial of stopping treatment? Like how do you, like, how do you phase people off of treatment? For which PCOS, treatment? which treatment? like 
like, do you leave people on birth control and metformin rather indefinitely if they're doing well on it? Or is there a point where you say, okay, if we've reached these milestones and we're going to start to wean off and see if you can menstruate without the pill and without metformin? Very good question. Um, most of the times, metformin, you know, usually I'll, I do recommend taking a break here and there. At maybe once a year, they can take a break. But the best time, the best way is once they lose five to 10% of their body weight and their symptoms are better, uh, it is good. It is a good idea to stop OCPs and metformin and just stay on natural therapies and keep up with the lifestyle changes and uh, dietary changes. And then it should be fine. I don't like to be, keep people on OCPs long-term because of all the other side effects that we talked about. Okay. Good, anyone else?